Golly, technology. Can you hear me now? <laughs> hey, there's a baby in church. It's adorable. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Thanks for being here. If the baby cries, that's what babies do. The rest of you whiners, just be quiet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If, if a baby whines, it's appropriate. <laughs> that's all I got to say. I have no idea who put the cactus on the bulletin. But I have gotten more response from the cactus on the bulletin than any bulletin. I don't do the bulletins. I have no artistic ability. I don't know if it was like some kind of, what do they call it, subliminal message. Like some of you are a little prickly. I don't know. I don't know. I had nothing to do with it. Um, I am glad to be home. I got back um, Friday night around 6.15 after about 38 hours of travel. Man, that is a long way home. Um, I was in Thailand at the end of the trip and got to, I don't know if you guys remember the Salmons, the couple that was going to Thailand. Um, Super wonderful young couple and got to have lunch with them one day and then the next day got to be with the Tuckers and um, had, a, um, had a really good trip in Sri Lanka, um, the, all the projects that we were help funding and the six different well projects and doing visiting some more things with the people afflicted with leprosy. I have a couple partnerships with some pastors who are going to help me put together some evangelistic outreach to those people afflicted with leprosy in northern Sri Lanka, and um, very excited about that, and, uh, but very, very glad to be home, um, and um, glad to see you this morning. Um, Leviticus chapter 23. Now, I decided yesterday because when I started into this series of grace in the Old Testament, I thought I'm going to do four lessons on each book. That way we can finish within, you know, a reasonable couple of years, <laughs> which for me was reasonable. For you, it might seem unreasonable. But then I got stuck here and there's just like so much stuff. So I decided where I finish today I finished today, we're moving on to numbers, okay? But um, there's so much more, and every one of the feast days that you see points to who? To Jesus. The, the feast of the Passover reminds you that you're forgiven. And how are you forgiven? Because like, you guys start shaking your head. There we go. Megan was shaking her head. I'm like, you know, don't make Megan feel all by herself. Like, give, give me some head movement here. Yeah, first service was like, those people were like, whew. I mocked them and made fun of them, and they still just, they wouldn't shake their heads. <laughs> Passover says what? I'm good. Why? Because of what I do or what he's done. This is a... The, 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 the thing that we got to constantly be reminded because the spirit of religion, if the spirit of religion invades the church, it's all about what we do. And as soon as it becomes about what you do, it's not good news. That, that's what you got to remember. Yeah, you on your good day are okay, but listen, you on your good days aren't, it isn't good enough. He came and he passed over the... the the, the Lamb of God shed his blood to restore us to relationship with him. It's not religion. It's all about relationship, which means we walk in intimacy with our creator moment by moment and day by day. And we can do this because our sin is no longer an issue. When someone sins against you, you know what I mean? Right? And, and I'm using sin in a different sense. They violate your trust. They wound you. They, they hurt you. And you keep a record. How does that affect your relationship? Right? It, it destroys it, doesn't it? You, you can't function well in a relationship where someone's keeping a record. So 
So if, if you're in a marriage um, or your, your relationship with friends or family or work or whatever, and you're going through and you're keeping a record of the wrongs, how are you going to do? You right? So even though you have a good day, if you're carrying around a load, a, a, a record, a receipt of all of the infractions, how do you move forward? It's just impossible. You're going you're gonna to keep the therapist in business, right? <laughs> you're going to keep the therapist in business. Why? Because you're carrying a load. And, and the first thing you got to learn in your marriage or the way you relate to your family or you wait, relate to coworkers is you got to live out the gospel in your relationships with man where there's no record because Jesus is not dealing with us today according to our transgressions, is he? That was so anemic. I mean, this is good stuff, people. Wake up. Is he dealing with you according to your transgressions? No, no he's not. That's good news. <laughs> I'm buying you lunch, girl. Who are you? <laughs> yeah, the wife says that. Ah, we're eating steak for lunch today. Yeah. Well, this is the reality. Vanessa and I could not be in a relationship, a healthy relationship, if she was carrying a record of all my transgressions, both of them. <laughs> like 35 years and two mistakes. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot to carry around, right? As soon as, as soon as a wife starts to carry a list of transgressions around, the marriage is done, even if it's not done. And that's true with your relation, the way you relate to your kids, you relate, relate to your family members, your coworkers. And, and, and I want you to realize that is the ultimate of what the gospel proclaims in the feast of the Passover is that he's relating to you as a beloved child, not your mistakes. And then the self-righteous think, well, he relates to me based on my successes. But forget your self-righteousness. He's not relating to you based on your successes. And he's not relating to you based on your failures. He's relating to you because of the finished work of the cross. Because the Lamb of God came to take away your sins. And so he's no longer dealing with you. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread came over to remind us that the living out of our sanctification is a reality that he wants, he wants us to experience. Because we're a forgiven people doesn't mean we go back into what enslaved us before, but we come out and, he, and we live free as a free people. And all of that leads us to chapter 23, verse 9. And let's read beginning with verse 9 and then through verse 11. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Well, Father, I pray that you just speak through your servant into the hearts of your beloved. And Lord, not, not more information. Bring about transformation in our lives. Let us acknowledge your reign and authority over us. And I just, I pray that you'd work. Give me the words. Give me boldness to say what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're forgiven, and the outworking of our forgiveness is our sanctification. And then he brings us to the place, and he says, listen, you're going to be going into the land, and he says, I'm going to give you a land with a, a, what he called what milk and it was a land of prosperity he said you're going to go into the land and you're going to reap harvest that you didn't even plant and he says as a part of that you're going to come and you're going to bring the first fruits of that harvest to me and you wave it before the lord he, he said it, it's, it's all about acknowledging the preeminence of christ now religion says do this and then you will be approved but when you realize what he's doing, for us, it's everything is flowing from our approval. 
We come and we come and we bring the first fruits, the offering that we have, the first of our harvest, and we wave it before the Lord. Now, whenever a pastor starts talking about money, people get nervous. And you should. <laughs> Listen, this really isn't so much about giving as it is about worship. Right? Because you, and people say, well, pastor, I, I, and I, I, I tell you this often, I don't know who gives what. When I came to this church a little over four years ago, I told the elders, I don't want to know. I don't sign checks. I'm a part of the budget process so that, you know, we have ministry goals. But listen, I, I, I don't know. You give, you don't give. I, I don't know. I don't care. But what I want you to do, what I really do care, is that you experience transformation. What I do care about is that you come to the place where you learn to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we did with, in singing, that can be a part of our worship, but you, a, a significant part of our worship is how we give to the Lord. And he says, listen, I'm taking you in and I'm gonna give you a harvest that you didn't deserve. Does anybody here want what they deserve? You know, I, I, I'm glad to hear you say that, but because sometimes I think I do. I know, it's like delusional. I, and, and usually for me, it's in the negative, right? Because I'm like, Lord, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. That's true, I don't. I deserve far worse. And so do you. Quit looking at me with those judging eyes. <laughs> like you thought, well, well, pastor, just confess. We're here to hear it all. No, but the reality is, listen, no one wants what they deserve. And when I look at the sum total of life, man, it's incredible what God's done for me. He's calling us as a people to live in the preeminence of Christ. And yes, I just came around being around hundreds and thousands of really poor people and so it always affects me and reminds me of how good I've got it. But l let me just share with you, there's something problematic with our Western Christianity and how we approach our relationship with God. Because what we've done to the gospel, is we've made it consumerism. It's no different than anything else that's going on. Right Now, my wife likes to go to Walgreens because it's easy to get in and out. But man, is that place expensive? And I'm always pointing that woman to Walmart. Why? Because Walmart is cheap. Now, I personally have standards. I don't go to Walmart. Because <laughs> I don't like the way they treat their employees, you know? And um, there's just weird people in Walmart. <laughs> Right? So I don't go to Walmart, but then I, I like HEB because you can get to the Bluebell without really a lot of resistance. It's right there. You know what I'm saying? So, so I, and HEB is cleaner and, and the people dress better in HEB. So, <laughs> what's that? That's what matters. Right, and, and, and I'm just having a little fun. Why, what, what do we do? We, we, go where, we go where we think they like us and they treat us the best and we did this and, and what benefits me, it has the best cost benefit for, for me and, and, and that all makes sense to us but my, what I'm trying to get you to realize, that's how we shop for a church. And, and I've had people that actually come to me and they say things like, well, pastor, I just want you to know, man, I'm, I'm shopping for a church and, you know, we're shopping. I'm like, keep moving. <laughs> because in Bernie alone, there's 20-something churches. And if all you're here to do is shop, I mean, just keep shopping. Because that's not what this church is about. And it shouldn't be about that for you. What, what, I, I'm coming to get the best value, the best bang for the buck. I'm coming to get what, what feeds me. And, and, and it all seems perfectly rational that we're here to get something. But I'm trying to get you to realize this isn't about you. It should be all about the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who we call Lord, the one who reigns and rules and has authority over what we do in our lives. You were not designed to be the authority over your life. 
and he's calling us, and, and all I want you to do is say, will you come today to live in the place where you say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, what Jesus wants to do, and let Jesus be glorified in it all. Because it's really not what you think or what I think. And he's saying, listen, I'll bring you into the land. And when you come into the land and you reap the harvest, come and bring back to me the first fruits. Why the first fruits? Well, I think it's just practical because it acknowledges the ownership of God of all things. Now, we don't have harvest, right? Um, it'd be cool if we, you know, raised vegetables and ate a little organic and, you know, took better care of ourselves. It'd be good. And if you have the, do that. But the reality is most of us, most, most of us go to a job. Some of you have to work five days a week. I work one day a week. Don't be bitter. Somebody's got to do it. Right? You, but you go to work and you reap a harvest and he's saying, Let, what do you do? When you get that, when you reap that harvest, what do you do? You bring that offering to the Lord. Why? As an act of worship. Is this a have to? No. There's no have to in the new covenant. It's a get to. This is about what you get to do. And he's saying, brings the first fruits because listen, at the end, you, there's never anything left. I was trying to teach this to my kids and another couple, and I said, listen, whatever God puts on your heart to give, give as soon as you get paid. And this is the amazing thing, because if I wait till I find out if I have anything left over, I don't know about the rest of you. This is not a complaint. This is not a message to the elders, but at the end of the month, I don't have nothing. I'm sitting there going, what happened to it all? It's gone. And if I wait to see what I have left over to give, I end up giving nothing. Now, some of you take that as a point of pride, right? You say, listen, uh, I don't give, and, and I'm like, whatever, I don't care. But it's robbing you of worship. Because it's not even about what the church needs. It's not about the pastor needs. It's not about what God needs, because God doesn't need any of it. It's about what you need. Because it, if you don't learn to worship the Lord with what he has blessed you with, you hold on tight. And he's calling for us to live in the preeminence of Christ. And the reality is you do this as a first fruits because, what, and this is what I find out, I get paid, and I know, I know, right? I just said it like, I get paid, and you're sitting there going, you get paid for doing this? I know, it's amazing. Don't tell the elders. Most of them don't come to church anyways, but <laughs> Ooh, they're not here. You don't show up. <laughs> no, they were all here in first service and I was nice to them. <laughs> but you know, I get paid. Yes, I get paid every other week. I get paid. And you know what I do? I, I get the check. I put it in the deposit and I get the, my checkbook. and I say, okay, Lord, this is yours. This is not mine. This is yours. What do you want? And I write the check. You say, you mean right then? Right then. And you know what I found at the end of every month or end of every pay period? I always have the same. I always have enough. You say, that's amazing. No, it, it is. It's a miracle of God. Because he's saying, listen, when I honor him and I, and I give this, why? When you say, well, how is that worship? Because it's me bringing myself and submitting myself to the authority of God. You say, well, Pastor, are you, telling, are you going to tell each of us how to give? No, because there's no have to. There's only get to. He said, will you bring your offering, your first fruit offering to the Lord? Will you wave it to the Lord? I have my check ready to put in the offering box. Hopefully I don't forget. And I should have been able to say even at home and say, Lord, here it is. This is yours. I worship you. Because I acknowledge you are the owner of all things. Psalm 24, verse 1 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The first fruit offerings is a beautiful picture to remind us, to remind Israel that God is the true owner of all things. And that you and I are called to live under his authority. But see, that what happens is we get our opinions and we get our ideas and we get, we get our thinking and we say, well, I think 
and, I, and then someone else says, well, someone else has an I think, and, he, and you have an I think, and all I'm saying is, listen, it's not about my think against your think. It's simply what does God, as the owner of all things, desire for you, his servant, to do? But we often elevate ourselves into the position of being Lord. And then we wonder why our lives get so messed up and disordered uh, and we find ourselves in bondage to possessions and to things because, he, because we're living in this place where we are the authority. And let me tell you, you as the authority is a mistake. And you will never live as someone in authority until you've learned to live under authority. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you, you ain't a boss of me. I'm not the boss of you. Because, and, and, and that's why I have no opinion about what you give. You give 10,000 or you give 10. I don't. It's between you and God. Do you see it? It's about how you come and you worship him and how you acknowledge him as the authority over your life. It's not what the preacher wants you to do. It's about what God, the one who reigns and rules in your life, what he desires for you to do. And you live healthy and whole when you live under his authority. And he says, always come to me with your first fruits. Because we need constant reminders that he is the source of our supply and he is our security. Because I'll tell you what the enemy wants to do. He wants to snatch your security and put in a spirit of fear. Have you ever been afraid? Well, I hate to admit it, but I, I live afraid sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. And one of the challenges of being sick and having a, an illness is, I'll, I'll tell you, man, the enemy, he started putting the screws to me. He, he, he started putting the screws to me. And, 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 and the first thing he would, it, he'd put to me was the fear of I'm not going to have enough. Now, who, you know, it's a male ego thing. It's stupid. I got it. But I, my first thought was, my health is declining Who's going to take care of my wife? And then I started thinking, well, you know what? I better get my act together. And what do we do? I think, I better hoard. Oh, you've seen that show, huh? <laughs> yeah. I better start hoarding. I, I better start making sure that I've got the bills paid and the cash stuffed away. And I started in my mind, folks, this is me, the preacher, the one who's supposed to have their act together. Oh, my goodness. It's a good thing that elders aren't here to know how messed up I really am. <laughs> I'm supposed to have my act together. And I, I was sitting there captivated with fears, trying to kind of, in my imagination, plans of some way how in the next short period of time that I'm going to have good health, when I don't even know what, you know, is going to happen. I'm just imagining the worst. Does anybody ever else do that? I mean, I can imagine the worst case scenario so clearly. Like, that's how God deals with us? And I said, no, I better not give, and I better hoard it, and I better make sure I do this, and get, make sure the more, and, and, and and all of a sudden, the Lord kind of clanged into my brain. Don't you trust me? And what is he saying? He brought me back to this, this passage of, of bringing my first fruits offering and saying, Lord, this is everything belongs to you. Even the ability to create wealth in Deuteronomy says comes from where? It comes from him. And he's saying, listen, I need. Not God needs, not the church needs. I need to be faithful and sacrificial in giving to the Lord because I need it. See, your giving isn't primarily because the church needs it. Sometimes the church needs it. But that's not the primary motive for giving. The primary give, motive for giving is to live under the reign of God where it helps me to loosen my grip because I think I need to be in control of this situation. Is anyone else here ever struggle with wanting to be in control? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was funny, Melvin. <laughs> Melvin raises Connie's hands. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> Yeah, Connie raised her own, man. 
There, there are control freaks and those who are in denial about being control freaks. I don't know which one you are, but you're one of those two, right? Because we have this impulse to forget that we live under the reign of a loving God who loves us, who adores us, who says, listen, you are my beloved and you can trust me. And so weekly or bi-weekly or monthly or however you do it, I don't care. Come and say, Lord, here's what you put on my heart to give. And I, I wave it before you because you're the source of my supply. You're the one who brings the harvest into my life. And I can trust you. I need that reminder that he's the source of all, that he's my sufficiency, that he's the promise of my supply. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 17 through 19. He says, not that I seek the gift. King James says, not that I desire a gift. He says, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Now just stop there and think about how amazing that is. The apostle Paul had gone to the churches and raised money for his missions efforts, just like we did at Christmas, and you guys were so generous to, to help me do this project where we were feeding and doing medical camps for the lepers, and, and, and God bless you. But you, do you understand the significance of the sacrifice that you made? You say, well, I gave that so that Pastor Tim could go do this, but look at the benefit to you. Paul was saying, it's not that I desire a gift, but he says, I desire fruit that may, the King James says, abound to your account. He's saying that there's this supernatural multiplication that takes place that when the gospel goes forth and it goes to Sri Lanka or to Thailand or, or, or to, uh, to, to Kenya or all the different places that we take the gospel or Nepal or, or wherever the gospel is going through our outreach, he's saying that in some mystical way, when the souls come to the, to come to the Lord, he's saying those go to whose account? They go to your account. So that even in our sacrificial giving, we're giving and contributing to so someone else can go, but they're really going on our behalf. Verse 18, he says, man, listen, I'm, I'm doing great. I, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received of Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. That's freedom. You see, you, you get up and the pastor beats you up every week about, you know, giving and all of that. You don't feel much freedom because you, they've made it into a religious exercise. I have to. And I'm telling you, listen, there is no have to. You say, you mean I can get away uh, and, and not give a thing? You can absolutely get away and not give a thing. Who, does it, who suffers? You do. Because what has he called you to? A fragrant offering. A sacrifice. Acceptable and pleasing to God. That's where each and every one of us should be coming. We're saying, you maybe do it at home and wave our offering to the Lord and say, Lord, I just want this to be a sweet fragrance. A sacrifice well pleasing to you. Why? Because I need it. But then it gives us this incredible promise. Look at verse 19. And my God will supply, the King James says, shall, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You see what it does? We bring our first fruit offerings to the Lord. We, not, our, not our have to, our, our want to. He changes our desires, the, our, our get to. And then we come to this place and we say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to work all of this out. Because sometimes God's going to put on your heart to give what you don't have the ability to give. And you do it in submission to him and obedience to him. And you say, listen, I'm just going to live on the promises. And I'm going to live on this promise that you, God, not me, because see, it liberates me. Then I'm not the source. I don't have to figure it all out. I don't have to make it happen anymore. Because as long as you got to make it all happen, <coughs> that's not good news for you. It puts stress on you that you don't need and, and, and won't live healthy. And he's saying, listen, but my God, my God, friends, he's going to do what? He's going to supply every need, not every want. 
I have some wants. But you know, reality is, he, he, he's done way more than just meet my needs, friend. You know, you say, Pastor, why do you go to Asia all the time? I mean, why do you go? Because it reminds me that I'm a one percenter. Yeah, you know, we live in Bernie, you know, poor Bernie people. Right? <laughs> Oh, us poor Bernieites, we're just barely making it. Barely making it. Are you kidding me? Yeah, some of us struggles, but aren't most of us, don't we have more problems of excess than lack? I mean, really, honestly? And he's saying, listen, out of that abundance, he says, listen, I, I'll give you everything that's good for you. Because I'm going to do it according to my riches. In glory. In Christ Jesus. In Leviticus 23, verse 12 through 14, it says, On that day when you have the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord, and the grain offering which it shall be, Two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen. And you shall, <laughs> excuse me, eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh until that same day, until you have brought the offering of our God as a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. In the old covenant, there was a lot of half twos. It wasn't just the Ten Commandments. I don't remember. Dave McCall probably remembers. How many laws and ordinances, Dave? 600 and a lot. A lot of have tos. Do you realize, friends, that Jesus came to fulfill all of the requirements of the law so there was no more have to? There's only get to. He called him, he said, recognize it, and he says, give unto the Lord. Our offering each week should be a sweet aroma to God as our source. Matthew 6, 20 and 21. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I thought about that verse, and I thought, well, that should ask, bring us to ask a question is, where's my heart? Where's your heart this morning? What's captivating it? Because that's where your treasure is going to go. And the only way you can really correct it is by altering where you place your treasure. Right? We, we're, we're called not to be a people who live for the possessions of this world. He tells us that to love the world is just to be, is, is to be at enmity with God. So where's our treasure? Well, where's our heart? Uh, if Christ is preeminent in all things and the one that rules and reigns in all of our relationship, it's going to be reflected in where we put our treasures. And the reason he calls us to this is so that we'll live with a loose grip so that our possessions don't end up possessing us. You see... The, the norm of what is normal in American life leads us to a debt-oriented culture, doesn't it? Where, you know, people, you know, people live as slaves to their obligations to loans. And I think what I, all I'm trying to challenge you is I think the gospel will lead you to a place where if you listen to the Holy Spirit and allow him to reign over your life, he's going to lead you to a, a debt-free existence so that your only obligation is to him. Because otherwise your possessions begin to possess you. The very things you looked at to be your treasures, to give you happiness, to give you wholeness, to give you feelings of, of completeness will rob you of that very completeness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 8. He says, the point is this. 
Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. So stop right there. This kind of lays out, without going in great depth, how the New Testament Christian gives. Who decides for you? Is there a formula? I don't think so. It's between you and who? And just you two. Isn't that good? As soon as someone tells you you have to, do, what, do you, what does that make you want to do? Well, some of us are a little more rebellious. Exactly. Right? I like it. I like it. Pauline, like, all I need is for a doctor to tell me not to eat liver, and I'll probably start liking it. No, no normal human being would just like it normally, right? But as soon as someone tells you no, what do you do? You want it. And he's saying, listen, just as you, out of your relationship with the Lord God Almighty, as he puts on your heart to give, he says, as you have decided in your heart, with you and your relationship, that's what you give. He says, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God has made all grace abound to you. So friends, even how you give is an act of God's grace. For God loves a cheerful giver. The, the lack of ability to give cheerfully says more about us than anything else, doesn't it? Mostly because we get this mentality, that's mine and I'm not giving it up. But who does it all belong to? His. I had this amazing thing. When Vanessa and I had just gone to the mission field, I had this bad habit of spending all the money on everybody and like would spend her grocery money and she got bitter about it. So we went to marriage counseling once again and you say, well, you mean you've been more than once? Multiple dozens of times. <laughs> and, and you shouldn't be ashamed of it. I mean, if you're married and you got issues, go get help. Go probably to someone better than me who's got their act better, but go somewhere. Don't, don't quit until you, you, you know, just keep working on it. So we go to the marriage counselor and the counselor's like, you can't do that, Tim. And I'm like, oh, all right. He's like, give her a budget. You guys get together, give her a budget of what it takes to run the house, then the rest you can put in ministry. I'm like, okay, cool. So then Vanessa had her money and we had my money. And, uh, well, then I found out almost nothing comes out of her budget. <laughs> and all of a sudden, she'd be like, you know, you should give that person $100. And I'd be like, is that coming out of your budget? <laughs> or is that coming out of our budget? <laughs> she'd be like, silly boy, you don't need to ask those questions. Like, That's coming out of your budget. And what I discovered was that woman is incredibly generous with my money. <laughs> In fact, she gave cheerfully my money. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. It's how the marriages work for 35 years. And then I started realizing, you know what? That's really how it is, isn't it? Because as soon as you think it's mine and what did I have to give to God, you embitter yourself because you think you have to do something. But when you come to the realization, man, everything I have, it ain't mine. I'm giving away someone else's money. Then it becomes fun. And that's what he's called you to. He, that's what he's called it. And God is able to make all grace abound to you in all things, at all times. You may abound in every good work. Father, thanks for loving us. Lord, teach us to live under your reign. And Lord, teach us to be generous. Lord, that every week we wouldn't be given because the church needs it, because we know you don't need it. But simply giving as an act of worship, 
joyfully because it's all yours. And let that be the effect of how we spend and how we live in the world. Be glorified. Lord, our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe there's someone here this morning who's never really received you. And I just pray that right now they'd say, yes, Jesus. I need you to be my Passover lamb. Take away my sins. Forgive me. Heal the wounds of my heart. If you're here this morning, you don't know for sure that your sins have been forgiven. Know this. All you have to do is say, yes, Jesus. I trust you. And he'll forgive you. And he'll sanctify you. Maybe this whole idea about money and giving and offerings has made you nervous. Maybe today you just say, Lord, I confess. It's all yours. Teach me to worship you in my offerings and how you want me to give and help me to realize every offering I give, I'm giving away your money that I could do it cheerfully. All I have is yours and I choose to live in the promise that you are my supply. And we confess together, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And Lord, I'm so grateful it's not a have to. It's a get to. Lord, move upon your people. Not more learning, but transformation. Transform us, Lord Jesus. Amen.